Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Codex group meeting, the last session of uh, the 2023 spring quarter. And, um, and we have um, two presentations lined up today. We have uh, Anthony uh, Novais, uh, who is a master's candidate in language at the Universi Universidade Presbyteriana. Mackenzie in Brazil, and he will be discussing his research on plain legal language and language and uh, how uh, the redesign of language can help make the more uh, the law more uh, efficient. And then we have oh. Kirill Igomenchev and Gora uh, Gorsha Sur, who are the winners of our um, of the non technical track of our recent large language models and law hackathon. And uh, they will be presenting their total trial prep project. Um, and so, yeah, two great presentations uh, for you all today. We'll, um, we'll uh, get started right away, but if you folks have any updates for the group, um, please, um, please use the chat function and share with the group. If you have any questions for the presentations, you can also use the chat or just unmute yourself. Okay, doc. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Anthony. Hi, everyone. I hope you are doing good. It's a pleasure being in here. I'm so thankful to the Codex, to Mr. Roland Vogan and Ms. Megan Ma for having me here. Um, let me please share my slides with you. Just give me a sec. I hope you guys are listening well. Well, let me start. My name is Anthony Novais. I'm a master candidate in language at the Universidade Presbiteriana Mackenzie. In English, it would be something like Mackenzie Presbyterian University here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It was actually an institution founded by American missionaries, so we are tied somehow. And this brief speech today is about plain language, legal design, and computational language and their interrelationship. And I hope it can add something of good to you all. Uh, firstly, let me speak on legal design in plain language and why I consider them to be to have a correlation because they are sides of the same coin. Um, legal design is about applying design to law to make it clearer and more accessible. Uh, plain language in its turn, it's about improving the clar clarity, sorry, of the language used in legal information by the elimination of complicated legal terms. In English, they are called legalese, in Spanish, abogadesco, and in Portuguese, we call this juridiques, and the long and confusing sentences, because it doesn't add to the experience of people. Uh, legal design, as it is known, has many layers. I adapted this graph from Stefania Passera, and today we're speaking more specifically on the layer of information design, which is about redesigning the way legal information is communicated to make laws, to allow law to better serve people and their needs. And both plain language and legal design share a common goal. Legal design once intends to improve the legal user experience by applying design principles and techniques. And plain language is about making the communication more understandable for everyone, regardless of their educational background. And this complementarity is shown by the fact that those are different spheres with the same objective. In the end, both approaches aim at making law better um, and they are connected. Speaking a bit more on plain language, um, the concept given by the plain, the International Association of Plain Language is that a communication is in plain language whenever the text, structure, and design are so clear that the target audience can easily find what they're looking for, understand what they have found, and use that information. Um, there is a similarity here because legal design is about applying design to law. So both plain language and legal design highly regard design as an important element for making law more efficient. And the benefits, some of the known benefits of, of the use and application of plain language in law in what is called plain legal language is empowering people so they become protagonists 
They make more well-informed decisions. It can help to combat hyposufficiency, not only educational one, but also social one and financial one, financial one, sorry. It can help to increase the understanding and clarity of legal information. And also it can help to reduce the tax length. And anyone who works with contracts and legal documents knows that sometimes they are mastodons, huge documents with complicated language that we spend like three or more hours reading a hundred plus pages to be able in the end to finally understand what a contract exactly provides for. And if we, the legal professionals, have those difficulties, what about regular people without legal formation background, legal education background? And here in Brazil, we have initiatives being developed by the public government, including the judiciary. We have a bill of law in this regard, the so-called national plain language policy for public bodies, which is under analysis in the National Congress. And it is said that later this year, ISO will publish a plain language standard. And this standard is uh, has been built upon the participation of both plain language associations all over the world and also the International Institute for Information Design. So this will be helpful because whenever a judge receives a contract for analyzing or an attorney or anyone who is dealt in this law-related situation has access to legal information, they will have they will have an internationally acknowledged standard for actually knowing and assessing whether it is or not in plain language. And speaking of legal design, plain language, and AI, one of the aspects embodied within AI is computational language, and its practical application is named natural language processing. There are many research centers here in Brazil working with that, and Brazil has everything to become the world-leading country in natural language processing for Portuguese language. Um, and the use of computational language can help to enable innovative, innovative solutions that democratize access to justice and also help to promote transparency in the legal system. It can also help to attain user-friendly and intuitive digital interfaces combined with visually presented legal content and plain language. And this has a crucial role in allowing people to make better informed decisions if we consider that most contracts related to the, to the everyday services everyone uses are adhesion contracts. I cannot say, hi, Facebook, I don't adhere to those terms and conditions and I want to dis discuss the clause one. It is impossible. You either agree and use their service or disagree and do not use the service. So, Clearer information helps people to decide what is better for them and also helps to fight the dark patterns, these manipulation techniques of the consumer behavior to make them make decisions that in the end are not so positive for them and instead for the company which assembled this product or, or service. And it also helps to develop intelligent systems based on computer language, which could help the research and analysis of legal documents, and also the drafting and reviewing of such documents. And I'll share a bit about two case studies, one in Europe and one in Brazil, and two in Brazil, sorry. Uh, in Finland, it was about the redesigning of the notifications about decisions on grant, granting or not pension benefits, speaking of private pensions. And in Brazil, the judicial discussion of the distribution of surplus by a closed private pension entity. In some countries, it is named pension fund. In Finland, the aim of the redesign of the document was to communicate important legal information in a way that was clearer, more accessible, and easy to understand, and highlighting the firm's brand identity. And here in Brazil, uh, there was an association of retirees and pensioners, which demanded our public public prosecutor's federal office uh, because they disagreed with what the sponsor of the private pension did. And then it was filed a class section by the public prosecutor's office. And then there was this law firm defending the interests of the sponsor, which filed within the lawsuit uh, a legal brief, including an infographic that helped the judge to understand the controversial issue. Um, so, in both cases, there were highly positive results because in Finland, uh, it helped to reduce litigation 
in this regard, it also helped to position this brand, which was already a leader in the Nordic market as a modern company. And it also had an adequate tone of voice and use of language. So the, the redesign document managed to include useful information for the next steps, even for special categories of people, such as people, people working in part-time jobs, which needed to deal with taxation aspects. So the documents, the final document after we design it, although it was bigger than the previous one because the first version was a one page but the second version had two pages those two pages sorry were substantially better than the original version because they informed key aspects that the consumers disclosed that they wanted to know more about and it was much more efficient and easy to use to the consumers so we so now this company has a set of revitalized documents, if you can put it this way. And here in Brazil, the sponsor of this private pension entity managed to help the judge to understand, to fully understand the issue because the class action was filed based upon the argument of the violation of a federal rule by the supervisory body, which rules, which supervises these pension funds markets. And this redesigned information, this infographic contained a main summary of the lawsuit, the important information, the, name, the main arguments for the defendants and all necessary information to allow the judge to briefly and easily understand what was happening and why this decision made by the sponsor, in fact, was not a violation of this federal rule as the public prosecutor's office was arguing. Regarding the other case here in Brazil, there was a project using legal design and AI to translate, if we can put it this way, judicial decisions with illustrated summaries and plain language. This project was named, uh, translating to English, Simplify 5.0 using legal design and artificial intelligence. To broaden access to justice, it was created by a judge named Aline Vieira Thomas from Annapolis, it is a city in the state of Goiás. And it managed to increase the satisfaction of the lay users who previously had difficulties in understanding the legal language and in nav navigating what is a really complex legal system, just like in the just as in the US. And they managed to do this, sorry, by the create by an, the use of an interdisciplinary team. So there were put together legal designers, software architects, a UI and UX UI designer and that, that analysis and statistics professionals. And these were the positive results were achieved by a many steps process. So firstly, they created a machine lear learning algorithm to assist in the classification of the information because in the beginning, they were drafting illustrated summaries and using plain language to the information regarding the lawsuits, the case records manually. So it took a really huge time. And then this team decided to use AI, created a machine learning algorithm, and this algorithm helped in the end to assist in the classification classification of the information in the making of those illustrated summaries and also in sending uh, notifications to the parties in those lawsuits by message applications. So instead of summons and an official notification that would take take days and depend on people being actually met in person by the judicial employee, the judiciary employee, this as nowadays everyone uses apps to communicate, this made the process seamless and smoother for the citizens, for the final users of the judiciary, because legal design is about thinking this reality for the final users, not for the ones who create the system. Um, this work resulted in positive feedback from both parties and lawyers. And uh, some examples which can be mentioned are reduction in the average time length of the lawsuit. So it was 
in the end, it decreased from 233 days to 177 days. And there was also a reduction in the appeal rate from 3.1% to 1.7%. In the end, it was a reduction of almost 50% in the appeal rate. And why this is important here in Brazil? Because we have millions of lawsuits, mainly sued by the state against the state, and we have a huge uh, time length for the lawsuit. So to achieve a first decision by the judge, a first uh, court decision, it could take up to two years. So whenever the public government uses technology to improve the judicial process, in the end, it helps both access to justice and what we call the administration of justice. And this interdisciplinary team managed to put it all together. And this initiative, I don't know if I have put this in here, but it received a prize in Brazil that is named prize innovating the category judge. So this judge, the, the judiciary branch she works at, received this prize prize for their effectiveness. And there are many ongoing efforts in Brazil to adopt language, but there is also some hesitancy by some public employees because they would like to have a legislation that authorizes them to do so. So this is why another of the reasons why there is this legislation pending on analysis by the Congress, which could have could make things better in the end because it is about people having access to public services, people accessing the judiciary, there, there is no one in the society which isn't affected by law. So this is why we should strive to make law its best version. And I truly believe that legal design, AI, computational language and plain language play a crucial role in this. Um, I'm, I believe I'm in the final minute, I guess. Um, I have here the QR code and the link. I'll just check with Roland and Megan later if I can share this presentation with you, but you have here a QR code should you want to have access to the full paper. It was a paper that I presented during the fourth International Congress on Law and Artificial Intelligence here in Brazil. I translated into English and put it in research gates. I have been in fact participating in some conferences in both uh, like US, Europe, such as Spain, Brazil speaking on related subjects. I have participated in CEP 2023 organized by the Illinois Institute of Technology speaking of ethics on AI on a broader uh, way, but also mentioning this research on plain legal language, legal design and computational language. And here you can find the paper. And the last thing I would like to say before moving to the references and leaving you my contact information is that as per my work in legal design, I have participated in the first legal design book launched by Aran Savi in Spain. Here you have the links on Amazon and Aran Savi should you want to have access to this information because legal design content is mostly written in English. So this was the main reason for putting together a collective book on Spanish to help access information. Here are the references. Um, should anyone would like to get deeper on those subjects. And here it is my contact information. You can have here my LinkedIn, Linktree also, and here are my mails. The hotmail.com is my personal, and this one, Mackenzista, is my institutional email from Universidade Presbiteriana Mackenzie. Just to translate it to you English speakers, Mackenzista in Portuguese means Mackenzie student, because Mackenzie is not like Stanford, Blah, blah, yada, yada, at Stanford.edu. Here, we students have a Mackenzie email. So guys, thank you so much for your time. I'll stop sharing in here. Uh, any questions are really welcome and I hope we can keep in touch. And thank you once again. Thank you, Anthony. Great. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. So first, um, I understand that, um, you know, there's some general studies out there that show that with plain language, uh, plain language and with legal design, certain court processes are more efficient and um, and people are less likely to, to challenge decisions and that sort of thing. Um, I think what would be interesting uh, to hear is some very concrete examples in a sense of like, this is how it was before and this is what, this is exactly how, how they changed the language or the design of a particular process to to kind of make it, at least for me, a little bit more tangible. But um, I'm curious as to where you you seeing uh, this research go? Is this sort of part of your 
master's thesis at uh, at your university or what's what's your which direction are you going to take this what's the future of this effort thank you Roland. firstly i'm sorry for not having brought here the images of of before and after i know visuals can help but some information is confidential so i cannot share publicly to avoid any copyright issues i decided to only use plain text and explain uh, secondly, this is part of my ongoing master research, which I intend to uh, develop throughout those subjects to create this bridge between the three of them, because legal design and plain language are, are related. Uh, this paper that I put, they have put together and presented recently is like an early, early, early findings paper on that. But I believe there are many ongoing um many ongoing projects not only in brazil in europe us as well and as people are crazy in a positive way about ai i believe the next frontier is taking this to ai and just to conclude i had previously uh, developed a pioneer research on legal design and insurance, where I had already had contact with legal design in plain language so now for the masters i'm advancing to encompass uh, computational language too, and in a broader way, not only touching upon insurance, but also touching upon education, public public policy, and so on. I hope I have answered you, Rob. Yes, you have. Thank you very much. Anyone else has a question for Anthony? And you can use the chat or um, you can unmute yourself. Uh -huh. I have a question. So um, my background is more on uh, machine learning and AI. So uh, did you use uh, large language models uh, for this? I believe that for this project, Simplify 5.0, it was not using a large language model. They created a machine algorithm just to analyze the ongoing information in the case records. This project I mentioned was not developed by myself. It was developed by a branch of the judici judiciary in the state of Goiás here in Brazil. But I can try to find more information and we we'll keep in touch just to ascertain this specifically. Um, no, that, that's it. That's good. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? I believe there's one in the chat, Roland. Yeah, Scott's saying, uh, what is uh, plain language in Portuguese compared with Finnish compared with in English and regarding the ISO standard? And uh, what are the different issues comparatively for legal design and legally? Hi, Scott. Thank you. I'll speak more of Portuguese because I'm more familiar in English than in Finnish, which is way uh, more complicated. But in the end, I'll begin with the end of your question and go to the beginning. Uh, regarding this ISO standard, the plain language experts are hoping that whenever ISO releases it, we will have a universally acclaimed and accepted standard to ascertain if something is written or not in plain language. And this would certainly affect law, not only the judiciary, but contracts, any situations where law is used, terms and conditions of apps and so on, because it would empower people to do so. Uh, but I believe that also people need will need to be taught specifically about the provisions of this ISO rule, so this can be actually, this can have actual practical outcomes, because if people don't know the content of this ISO rule, it will have no practical outcomes. Um, here we have many rules, speaking, you ask it comparison, comparison between legal design and legally. Here in Brazil, we have many rules where the public government fosters the use of legal design. We have a supervi supervisory body for the judiciary, which is named Conselho Nacional de Justiça. It would be something like the Brazilian Justice Regulation regulatory boards, and they have issued recently a rule where they ask visual law to be used whenever possible to make easier the access and understanding of legal information. Although visual law is a term that is not really used in the US or in Europe, here in Brazil, many people use visual law when making reference to information design. And just to con and going to the moving into the conclusion, what are the different issues comparatively for legal design and legally? Well, 
I believe both are complementary. When I speak about legal design, I think of human-centered design, plain language, visual law, and also UX writing, amongst many other disciplines, according to the approach each one adopts. When we speak about plain language, we think about the text, the structure, and design of information. So in my humble understanding, legal design is wider than plain language, but they are intertwined by the components of redesigning the language as to ensure a better UX and accessibility. I hope I answered it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Anthony, other, so I think uh, your lawyers are frequently accused of obfuscating, you know, um, what's really going on with legalese. But at the same time, there are some rules um, around the world that say that, you know, the party that uses language that is uh creating confusion will have it sort of the, that uh, rule or that clause be interpreted you know in sort of in favor of the other party right so so to some degree i think the law is already trying to create some incentives for lawyers to uh to to be clear uh but you're basically saying but that's that's not enough right we need to be especially when we talk about about you know legal rules that that are uh, focused on you know consumers that are not educated in the law i guess yes i think so roland uh, as an example here in brazil we have a strong consumer protection legal framework we have even a public agency procon which deals specifically with that and in other nations such as germany i heard that during the last years they were deciding and debating whether they needed or not a strong consumer protection because it, some, most of the people there thought that consumers were already properly protected by the legal framework they had it is it has to do, in my view, with the hyposufficiency and with the information asymmetry, because lawyers and legal professionals write the contracts. They understand, but people do not understand those contracts in the end. So this is a really difficult situation. I understand this, this issue with I cannot cause confusion because the clause will be interpreted against me, but maybe, Roland, in the beginning of the contractual relation, both parties could decide together the redaction of the clauses. So it is more democratic, and if something, some issue arises, none of them will say something like, oh my God, I didn't know about this, because they previously agreed on those clauses, and in the end, the result will be, would be, sorry, substantially better. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. Um, so Megan has uh, uh, left a, co a comment too. If you asking if you have connected with the World uh, CC, a commercial contracts, I guess World CC uh, contracts design library. If so, is your research a parallel contribution to this effort? Hi, Megan, thank you. I know World CC and people there, Stefania Passera is like a poster girl. I love them and the work they are developing in redesign contracts, but this design library, I believe it is restricted to members. And I believe Stefania Passera was on one of the persons who developed most of those designs. Um, she's based in Finland, to the best of my knowledge. But I, I will take the suggestion to keep in touch with them and check out for the purposes of my master's research in which is in, in, in which stance, sorry, they are in regards to plain language, because maybe there is something useful there that I can mention from my research. But thank you for the suggestion, Megan. All right, Anthony, we're pretty much uh, at the halfway point of our time today. So uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, quick round of uh, applause for you and good luck for uh, this, uh, the continuation of your, your project. And um, yeah, so uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Gorsha and uh, Kirill. So, thank you so much. Thank you again, the winners of the non-technical track of our recent hackathon. So over to you, Gorsha and Kirill. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, thank you, Roland. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so we will, um, Kirill and I, uh, we will, just share the results of our uh, sort of hackathon uh, project that turned out to be a very interesting uh, sort of um, 
uh, solution or attempted solution at, um, at, at, um, at significant problem that uh, often arises in complex litigation, uh, which we'll explain later. So just a quick um, information about me. So I'm a US trained lawyer. Uh, and also I have an LLM degree in international commercial arbitration uh, from Stockholm University. Uh, my uh, legal background is in international dispute resolution and international arbitration. Uh, and also uh, I work both in Europe and here in the United States and also uh, litigation uh, and dispute resolution and so forth. So uh, the problems that we have encountered uh, and I've encountered in my practice uh, certainly um, uh, can uh, relate it uh, through different uh, areas of law, but mainly they are focused in uh, complex complex litigation. So um, the the product that we created or, uh, is called Total uh, Trial Prep. And basically, it's uh, it uses uh, an LM uh, to collect uh, data that is uh, well, available out there, uh, whether it's in uh, public data sources or um, in the private data sets, and organize, collect it, uh, curate it, and analyze it in a trial ready uh, form of evidence and witness statements. Uh, uh, witness lists, uh, fact, li uh, fact witnesses, expert witnesses, and um, uh, and also uh, with with time, it would would be able, also be able to uh, pull together from those data sets uh, evidence such as photographs and videotapes and video recordings and documents. Um, and again, organize them in a similar manner. Uh, we didn't really have time to do that uh, because uh, using the, the uh, chat GPT uh, for that we used uh, for our purposes did not allow us to do um, more but actually photographs and videos um, uh, because it would require some coding and we did not want to go there because of the time, con time constraints. So we used only um, uh, this uh, kind of uh, system that we created, tried to create uh, to uh, put together uh, witness lists and uh, their testimony. And then uh, we asked the, uh, our system to draft a complaint and um, we ran it. We actually then we asked to uh, draft a, a response to the complaint uh, uh, with the idea to kind of to improve on, the, on our original complaint uh, and then we ventured into ask the system to prepare uh, visual trial aids that can be used in trial based on the witnesses that we have and the witness testimony that we have and the uh, same with the expert witness as well. So, um, and that the idea is to have, to have an assistant, a virtual assistant that would help you from uh, an attorney uh, from A to Z throughout the trial preparation, uh, preparation process uh, with sorting uh, the data and uh, information and evidence and witnesses and make it in a way, uh, sort of curate in a way that an attorney can use it in, in trial uh, and uh, uh, yeah, for various reasons. So the, I guess the, <laughs> the future plan would be uh, is to create a completely automatic uh, system uh, based on LLM uh, that would uh, do the same and you know, um, starting from collecting evidence and uh, witness statements and so forth uh, to you know, uh, drafting pleadings and uh, uh, you know, and then preparing all that uh, automatically. As a lawyer, I'm I don't necessarily believe that. Uh, uh, AI would replace lawyers, but who knows what's going to happen, you know, uh, with time. So um, our use case was based on the um, uh, on on the recent announcement of the development uh, announcement by the Council of Europe on the development of the 
register of damages caused by the Russian Federation uh, in the war against Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the announcement came uh, just a few days before the hackathon, and I thought, my gosh, that seems like such a monumental task, given the amount of uh, uh, destruction caused by the war and the damage caused to Ukraine. So how do you, um, how do you keep track of all the damages? How do you uh, then put it in a way that you can use in court which is you would, uh, again, you would sort of find witnesses, locate witnesses who saw uh, the commission of a crime. Uh, in this particular case, it would be a war crime. And, uh, and so sort of uh, match the legal elements with that witness statements, with the, uh, you know, with the witnesses and evidence and help uh, uh, the petitioner to, uh, or the claimant uh, to prepare a complaint that would sort of take into account all that information, you know, from the witnesses and evidence, and in each particular instance to, uh, you know, to prove each particular crime. Uh, it seemed to me that it, it would take years, if not decades, uh, to, to do, uh, you know, to work as a lawyer on such a project. Uh, probably thousands and thousands of man hours and probably millions and millions of dollars in legal fees to, uh, you know, just to put, prepare this case for trial. So in that respect, using uh, an LM uh, model is, uh, seemed to be essential and, and probably necessary. And that's probably what's going to happen. Anyway, so um, our goal was to kind of get a jump start on the creation of such a registry and see what we can do uh, just using the tools that are already available, such as uh, ChatGPT4. So um, we are uh, using different prompts. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, let me back up. So we used only two sources of, uh, of data sets. So one, one of the sources, uh, was uh, a report prepared by Amnesty International that was published uh, on their website and quoted in uh, several media sources that kind of um, uh, set the stage for, uh, you know, for, for the recollection of the bombing of the uh, drama theater in Mariupol in, in March of 2022. So, and the second source was an uh, Associated Press article uh, also about the bombing of that theater uh, that also mentioned some witnesses and uh, photograph, posted some photographs and so forth. So again, we couldn't use the photographs, but uh, we used the names of the witnesses and uh, what they saw and what they, um, uh, what they witnessed and uh, what they can testify about to actually uh, uh, to prepare a list of witnesses and their testimony. So, and then we matched it with, uh, uh, with the cause of action, such as loss of life, loss of uh, damage, property damage, uh, as a lawyer would do. Uh, and then we used as our legal forum, uh, we used the International Court of Justice, although it's not necessarily where the case would be tried uh, and it, uh, it can be any forum really. And the, the important part is that uh, to know what the, the applicable, uh, the governing rules of procedure, the law and so forth, and then use the elements. And actually, as we move forward, we will be able to expand on our, uh, uh, on our uh, work product to incorporate more and more sort of details and elements that would closely match what we're trying to prove in court. Uh, so um, Kirill will show in a second uh, the uh, sort of the result of that of that uh, work. Uh, but I want to say that despite the fact that we used a very specific case uh, and the very specific uh, sort of instance, uh, the same method can be applied in really any uh, com complex litigation, uh, whether it's uh, investor state arbitration, whether it's the human right violation, 
uh, whether it's maybe a uh, product defa uh, uh, defect case or um, uh, maybe it's class action uh, suit when the, potentially there are many witnesses, dozens of witnesses uh, with you know, saw something, an incident, the incident happened, maybe they posted something on their social media, uh, whether it's photographs or, uh, you know, some, uh, uh, some videos, and then, uh, you know, pull all that information together, organized in a way that can, uh, can be used by a lawyer, and, and then help the, uh, draft the pleadings, and then prepare the lawyer to kind of to go to trial and, uh, and uh, argue the case in front of the tribunal or in front of the jury. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn, uh, turn this presentation over to Kirill, uh, who will speak about sort of the technical part of the project. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Kirill. Uh, I have a background in uh, um, AI, uh, data privacy, um, some crypto. And uh, we teamed up with Gosha to do this project. Uh, um, so um, just to recap, uh, what we do is we take a lot of data and I showed you examples of this. So there are PDF articles, which are not easy to par parse. And uh, these text articles. So we take these articles and what we do is we extract uh, evidences, uh, items and witnesses. And we assign the category and we create a registry. And then we use this registry to create a complaint. And then uh, from that complaint, uh, we uh, prepare for the trial. Uh, and there are other things like we ask to simulate a response, we find the experts. So these are all uh, things that uh, LLMs can do. So LLMs are large language models. Uh, the most famous one is uh, ChatGPT. And what it does, it basically has a huge neural network that trains on a lot of material. So chat GPT is trained on general material. And just like a person, if you train a person on something specific like law, it would be a lot more accurate. But because we have uh, general uh, large language models, uh, the accuracy is not that high, but it still showed really good results. So the hardest part is the first part is to extract the most important information. So then we take, for that, we take uh, the article. So it starts with uh, Lviv, Ukraine. And uh, uh, here you, you can see it starts with Lviv, Ukraine. So we create uh, this prompt that basically says, extract a table with uh, evidences and witnesses. We uh, give it a text. And then we get a table where we have a name, uh, who that witness saw injured, a location, description of a property damage, type of injury and source. So all of these materials would be used in, uh, uh, in the complaint. So uh, we do this and we get the table, we put it into CS comma separated value uh, form. So it's easy to copy and paste. The other thing we do is because there are a few documents, we uh, summarize each document. So here we ask to, for a summary and we ask for a summary so that uh, the prosecutor can write a legal complaint of damages. And we give some constraints on how to do that. And then we paste the document again and we get a summary. And we do that for all three documents. So, oh, so AP News had to be broken in two parts because it's too long. And ChatGPT has a constraint on how long the text can be. So this is the second part of it. Uh, and it also shows that you can break down documents into multiple parts, which is really good. Uh, so there's a summary of it. And uh, then there's another article from Amnesty, from the PDF. And, the interesting thing here is I just copy and paste PDF with like with page numbers and uh, uh, the chat GPT did a good job extracting the names of the witnesses and uh, what happened from that. Uh, so then, so we did this process 
right? Uh, and now we go to the generate complaint. So what we did here, we put summaries together. We said combine two of the summaries from uh, first two articles. We got the response, and then we asked to combine the previous summary to another summary. So we add another summary. And we specify the format of the summary. Uh, so we get that. And then we add the table, this that the CSV table that you saw uh, over here, which is exactly the same as this table, but it's just easier to read for machines. We add all of those three tables together and we had to do some tuning. For example, we had to tell, um, uh, yeah, so, um, so yeah, we, we made this, um, complaint, uh, we specified, um, the constraints and we added the table and that's how we got this uh, complaint so you can read it a little bit and then what we did is uh, what we did is we asked uh, for what would be the reaction of defense lawyer so that it helps people prepare uh, for the case and uh, then we also asked for the top five witnesses. So ChatGPT found us top five witnesses. It makes sense, uh, even though ChatGPT is trained on data before 2001, uh, the witnesses probably didn't change in the last few years. So we decided to use that. And then we also asked to prepare, pre prepare a, a, a deck, a slide deck for the, for the trial. Uh, so, we talked about uh, extracting information from the data, writing complaint, then uh, simulator response, add an expert, and uh, uh, create a trial prep as a slide deck. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so this is the, the overview. I'm a little bit over time. Um, so uh, questions are welcome. Cool. This is great. And uh, what an interesting use case, too. And also, thanks for explaining sort of the different stages uh, at which large language models and generative AI could be leveraged to uh, help in a sort of the management of, you know, very large kind of um, legal situations and uh, cases. And so, um, so my question is of one is, um for generating the complaint did you actually um put in an example of a complaint into chat gpt or did it by itself just find a, a complaint from the international court uh, uh of criminal, it, it, uh, criminal justice court uh independently it, it found the complaint independently uh so our assumption was that uh when chat gpt was trained uh, on all the available material which, which includes uh, internet and books it would uh, create something similar to that complaint a proper way to do it would be to either give it a template that gets filled up or fine tune chat gpt on similar complaints and then it would uh, create a fairly accurate complaint uh, if you go for accuracy the way that people do it in uh, uh, using large language models for mathematical proofs or programming or API access, they generate, um, it becomes kind of like a game. They generate uh, uh, the program or complaint, and then there's uh, another model that tries to find uh, the problems with it. Uh, so they compete and the accuracy becomes higher. Interesting, cool. And also uh, for, for each particular forum, you can use uh, complaints normally those documents or well, depending on the forum might be available on the uh, on that forum's website so for example in investor state arbitration uh, there is the, the, the organization called exit um, uh, uh, located in Washington 
and that is sort of publicly available information and you can scalp or you can use uh, their uh, sort of uh, pleadings and uh, responses as um, you know to to prepare sort of to to feed into the uh to train the uh the lm and uh, have it prepare a very specific forum specific uh pleading mm -hmm. so ron's asking um did you test the results on random specific questions to ensure that every result was correct uh not confused or mixed up uh especially well downstream in the documents or prompt responses uh no we didn't test it uh, it's uh this project is uh, more of a vision we did not expect a uh, higher accuracy uh, there are a number of techniques to get to the higher accuracy and uh, uh what uh, ron ross is talking about uh, the most uh, uh, effective one is reinforcement learning with human feedback uh, but that would require more than a few hours that we had for hackathons. Right. Right. Yeah. And we also use different prompts uh, to get the results that we want, uh, you know, from the uh, from Jap, uh, chat GPT. Uh, so, for example, at one point we were asking uh, find witnesses uh, who uh, can testify about the explosion. And we were giving the list of those witnesses. Uh, and uh, so then we asked where were they located. So we got that uh, that list. So you can play and fine tune uh, you know, the results, uh, what you're trying to achieve based on uh, just using the prompts and different information, so requests and the prompts. Yeah. And your prompt for creating this um, uh, uh, this table here, was basically uh, you gave it uh, the um, uh, the labels for the columns, right? You said, well, you should extract those entities from the text, or did ChatGPT by itself extract those as the relevant entities in the text? Uh, so we gave it the names, and so the names of the columns are basically uh, what we want. So. You can see it was a uh, name of the witness who that witness saw injured. And we played around with those a bit to be precise enough, but also be short enough for the presentation. Like people use much larger prompts usually when they want something more accurate. Um, so yeah, to answer your question is uh, we just put this and uh, mm -hmm. that worked. And and you also, I saw another place you also, it also, found you expert witnesses who are not who were not there for the yes so action. we looked them up uh i don't know if we did it this time because we improved it uh comparing to the hackathon but uh uh yeah so uh last time we looked at their names up oh, and yeah. uh okay that's a there okay yeah I, I don't i don't know maybe you recognize some of them <laughs> uh, sure. but <laughs> cool. yeah. awesome so what's next for this project uh so yeah just just notice this i mean the question about accuracy was fair and we had uh four or five hours of work and we didn't uh start this project beforehand so we were limited on time uh for this project well uh uh we uh, me and gosha we're talking about how to use uh ai for legal and accuracy is important so we plan with the ideas um and I, I actually i'm more on the technical part i think gosha can tell you more about uh where the customer is or the user uh, right so well one of the ideas was to actually to offer this uh you know uh the results of our uh research uh to the government of ukraine to see if that might be helpful in their sort of in their work um you know persecuting this case uh and uh but also, I guess, depending on the interest it might generate, uh, we can tweak it to sort of to, to make it more, uh, you know, user friendly for uh, litigators, uh, whether it's in, you know, domestic or uh, international. Uh, it, it will require a lot of work, though. So uh, it really depends whether or not, you know, we have the time and uh, uh, the capacity to you know to continue working on the project I, I think it's 
Uh, it has tremendous potential, tremendous potential, especially if you invest some time and effort into prompt writing and maybe um, uh, doing some uh, uh, just improving the improving the product, like Kirill was saying, uh, based on you know based on human sort of comments and interaction uh, to make it you know uh, to make it to customize it uh, for the needs of uh, you know legal professionals um, in various fields. Did you already get a reaction from the Ukrainian government? No, we haven't reached out yet because I think at this point the product is a little bit too raw, uh, you know, to to present to them. But uh, it's definitely sort of uh, it's in the plan. Okay, because yeah, I think they they established that they will, as you said at the beginning of your presentation, that they they will seek justice for every all the. Uh, you know, the war crimes that, that have been perpetrated. And so right. that seems like a good way to do this at scale. Um, so anyway, so, well, good, uh, great. Well, thanks, uh, Kirill, for uh, sharing the contact info. Um, I just wanted to, we have a, a few more minutes, wanted to see if anyone else had any, any questions for Kirill and Gorsha. Uh, I also feel free to ask a uh, question about AI generally because uh, I, I work with the models. Cool. Uh, anyone? Any questions? Let me see uh, the chat. Uh, well, good. Well, if, if there's no more questions, then let me thank our presenters today. Thank you so much. Kirill, Gorsha, and Anthony for your great presentations and the great work you're doing uh, to improve our legal system and uh, and bring new ideas to the space and trying out new models. And this is really important and groundbreaking work. And it's it's uh, really fantastic for us to be able to learn from you. And um, and so really appreciate you you sharing your time and your insights with us. So thank you very much. Thank you all the participants uh, in this session and in all other sessions we had during this uh, spring quarter. I think we had a series of really good conversations throughout the last quarter. Uh, this will be our last session for the, the uh, 23 spring quarter. Uh, we may convene over the summer, maybe once or twice, but uh, we'll certainly pick it up again uh, in, the, in the fall quarter uh, in September. So, so thank you all again uh, for, for joining us and uh, for continuing uh, the great work in the space. And uh, yeah, please reach out over the summer uh, if you have any news to share with us. Uh, you know how to reach uh, uh, Megan and me. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, have a great summer and, and see you uh, next time. Thank you all. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, everyone. Okay.